Hello, my name's Kevin Buzzard. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about computers and humans. I'm going to compare the skills of a computer uh, with the skills of a human. And ultimately, I'm going to ask the question, uh, which one is better, which one will be better at doing mathematics? So I have to say what mathematics is, so I'll spend some time talking about which kinds, you know, what kind of mathematics uh, I'm discussing here. And uh, then we'll go on to see computers and humans and uh, try and try and figure out, you know, which one is best or maybe if they can uh, help each other in the future. So uh, what's a computer? Very briefly, you know, abstractly, the computer is a device uh, which can run a computer program. And what's a computer program? A computer program is just a list of instructions uh, telling the computer what to do. And what the computer is very good at is following the instructions very, very quickly. Uh, this is somehow uh, its key skill. It follows the instructions unthinkingly, but quickly. So a computer is really an unimaginative and yet very efficient assistant. So it's rather unlike a human. You know, a human could uh, make mistakes when following instructions. A human could also make suggestions about uh, perhaps there's better ways of doing the job that, uh, that it's supposed to be doing. Uh, computers won't query uh, the instructions that they're told to do. They'll just get on and do them, but they will do them very fast. So, for example, if we give a computer a calculation, if a computer knows the rules for multiplying numbers together, you know, column multiplication, uh, then a computer will be able to do that kind of problem much, much quicker than a human. Uh, but can a computer think? I mean, this is a very complex question, you know, uh, and could a computer come up with a proof of Pythagoras' theorem? Humans came up with a proof of Pythagoras' theorem thousands of years ago. Uh, and another question one could ask is, uh, What's the relationship between these two questions? I mean, does one need to think to come up with a proof of Pythagoras' theorem? Uh, is, you know, what do we even mean by thinking? So, uh, you know, complicated questions, uh, but let's press on. So computers have memory, and computer memory is a bunch of on-off switches. Uh, you know, a typical computer nowadays has many, many of these switches. So in the old days, in the beginnings of uh, modern computing in the 1940s and 1950s, these switches were valves. Uh, so they were quite bulky objects. And uh, by about the 1960s, we'd figured out how to get thousands of these valves into one computer, which made computers at the time uh, very, very large. There's a picture of the, uh, the ENIAC computer from, uh, from Pennsylvania. There's uh, some of its valves. Uh, but after the Silicon Revolution, uh, the switches became transistors, which were much smaller and much faster and also much less likely to break. So in a modern phone, you know, a phone is a very simple example of a computer. A modern phone contains billions of these switches, all, you know, all compressed down onto some very small chips. Uh, and also, a computer can switch many, many of these switches very, very quickly. It can switch millions of switches. I mean, it's a bit complicated to explain what's really going on. There's different kinds of switches, and certain switches can be switched faster than others. But uh, it's certainly safe to say a computer can switch millions of switches uh, in one second. And what's a switch? A switch can be on or off. So the computer spends a lot of time switching switches from on to off and from off to on. Uh, so what use? what use is that really? Well, uh, the idea is that a switch can be used to represent zero and one. You know, zero can be off and one can be on. And so that means we can, a computer can represent zero and one. I mean, these are, you know, the first two numbers, but uh, ideally we'd want more than that. But a trick using binary uh, means that computers can represent much larger numbers uh, because, you know, numbers can be built from zeros and ones, numbers in base two. So that means computers can store very large numbers. And of course, using other tricks, for example, you know, for example, codes, numeric codes, uh, computers can be used, you know, these numbers can be used to represent letters. So computers can be used to store symbols. And uh, any problem that you have that you can express using symbols, you can store that 
in a computer. So, you know, as long as, as long as the problem can be expressed using a finite number of symbols, uh, you know, it can be it can be stored by a computer so the computer can think about that problem, you know, whatever whatever thinking means. You know, the computer can represent the computer can store some kind of representation of this problem. So let me start by talking about chess. So what's chess? Chess is a game uh, played on an eight by eight board and uh, it has a finite list of rules. Uh, and you know it's a very old it's a very old game goes back nearly fifteen hundred years, and uh, humans play this game and some humans are very good at it, and we feel when we are playing chess that we're you know we're being creative we're seeing you know we're making cunning new plans we're having ideas, uh, and you know uh, computers don't have ideas right. So in the 1970s, uh, humans taught computers to play chess because this is possible, right? Uh, you know, chess is a, a, it's a finite situation. There's a large number of possible chess positions, but the number of chess positions is finite. And computers can be taught the moves of chess, can be taught how to move between positions. And in the 1970s, humans did exactly that. They taught computers how to play chess. And uh, at the time, Computers would do it by trying every single move and then trying every single response and then trying every single response to that you know, until they ran out of time because these things blow up exponentially. And uh, after a while, we have to stop thinking about new positions and have to start deciding uh, which move we're going to make. So computers you know, were taught some primitive ways of weighing up different positions. And, uh, and off they went and they played chess and they played chess rather poorly, in fact, in those days. Uh, it was very, you know, in the very early days of computing, uh, most average club players could easily uh, could easily hammer a computer. But then uh, IBM got involved. IBM, a very big computer company, and uh, started making bespoke computers, sort of uh, specialising in chess. And uh, what happened then was uh, quite shocking. By the late nineteen nineties. Uh, computer chess computer programs have got extraordinarily good, and then they started beating grandmasters. And in fact, nowadays uh, the best computers are way, way better than the best humans. You know, humans cannot compete with computers nowadays when it comes to chess. So that's kind of interesting. You know, were computers thinking? Uh, because humans were certainly thinking when they were playing chess. Uh, how has this happened? How did computers? You know, come over over a twenty year period. How did they go from being very very weak chess players to being much better than every human? So, two reasons I'd like to highlight. Uh, firstly, computers were getting really really fast by the nineteen nineties. You know, we'd we'd worked out we'd worked out what we were, what we were doing really. So, computers were becoming extremely fast. I mean, comprehensively fast by then. And uh, secondly, IBM had uh, trained their chess program on many, many, many games played by experts, hu expert humans. So in some sense, the computers weren't having the ideas, the computers were stealing the ideas. You know, grandmasters were having good ideas and the computers were looking at these ideas and learning from these ideas. So there's you know, two, things, two things that had occurred by the 1990s, uh, which between them uh, uh, made computers better at chess than humans. So computers took those ideas and turned them, figured out how to turn them into instructions and, uh, and off they went. So this is called artificial intelligence. I'll mention this uh, several times during the talk, AI, artificial intelligence. The idea is you know, it's difficult to make you know, computers smart uh, by having ideas, but uh, so we have to think of other ways of making them smart. And AI is the area of a, uh, you know, trying to give computers you know, some concept of intelligence by training them in some way. And nowadays, of course, so this is great. I mean, that didn't destroy chess, right? Once computers became better than humans at chess, uh, humans began to use computers you know, to, to help them uh, learn more about chess, to help them analyze chess positions, and to help humans become better chess players. So you see, this wasn't a case of computers becoming better than humans at chess and then somehow chess being becoming irrelevant, you know, chess is still a very popular board game, uh, but uh, humans and computers work together to understand chess nowadays. So this is in some sense, you know, a big step forward 
you know, both for AI and for chess, the fact that computers are now very good at it. So let's talk about a more complicated game. Uh, this is a picture of a game of Go, uh, a popular game in, uh, you know, very popular in uh, China and Japan. Uh, and uh, this is played on a much bigger board. It's played on a 19 by 19 board rather than an 8 by 8 board. And uh, in a typical Go position, a player could have hundreds of moves. And so it's much harder to analyze Go than chess uh, because the possibilities you know, increase exponentially even more quickly than chess. You know, at the beginning of a chess game, a player has around 20 moves. At the beginning of a Go game, they have around 300 moves and then 300 responses and then 300 moves after that. So things get out of control very quickly. So Go is a game played on a large board, but again, with a finite list of rules. You see, Go, Go is a finite game. And, you know, of course, computer scientists taught these rules to computers, and then we had computers that could play Go. And just the same as chess at the beginning, uh, the beginning Go programs were very, very poor indeed. Uh, it took a very long time to get a reasonable Go program just because of the, the size of the game. Computers are fast, but you know, Go, Go in some sense is a gigantic game. If you look at all the possible Go games, you know, this is an incomprehensibly large number. You know, computers, you know, there's not enough particles in the universe. You know, we can't make enough switches to store all those games. So we have to think of newer ideas, uh, but you know, artificial intelligence goes on. Artificial intelligence is an important topic of, topic of modern research. And uh, DeepMind, an AI company, uh, got involved in trying to learn, you know, trying to get computers to play Go. And by the end of the last decade, you know, lo and behold, computers were beating humans at Go as well. So this took longer because we needed even faster computers and we also needed newer techniques in artificial intelligence. But it did happen a few years ago that uh, computers started beating humans at Go. So how did this happen? Well, again, uh, DeepMind's programs used you know, more advanced machine learning techniques. AlphaGo, their first breakthrough uh, Go program, used modern machine learning techniques. Uh, which is a part, you know, this is a part of modern AI research, machine learning. It's a you know, relatively new, new development. It barely existed when IBM were trying to tra train computers, uh, were trying to train computers to win at chess. But, you know, now this is a, you know, at, the, at the front of modern AI research, various kinds of machine learning. And again, of course, they used uh, the, the initial program that, uh, that DeepMind used, again, analyzed lots of human games. So it took ideas from humans. But one can ask the question, you know, is, AI, uh, is, this, is this AI that's beating all humans at Go, is it having ideas? Uh, or is it just trying everything really, really quickly? You know, in some sense, you know, the, the, tr the truth is some, is, you know, it's, it's, the truth is more complicated uh, than either of these things in some sense. Uh, but whatever it's doing, whatever machine learning is doing nowadays, uh, it's managing to solve gigantically huge board games like Go. And indeed, after DeepMind solved Go, well, became better than humans, at least, at Go, uh, some computer scientists announced that really board games were solved. You know, come up with any board game you like now, and you're going to be able to find uh, that a computer will be better than it, better than it, better at that game than even the best human. So finally, on to mathematics. So what is mathematics? Well, mathematics is lots of things. Uh, mathematics is, you know, it, it runs the world. It's the language of physics. Uh, it's, it's used extensively in engineering. In theoretical computer science, mathematics is used. You know, in fi it's a key part of finance. You know, finance, finance is run by numbers and mathematics is in some, you know, one part of mathematics is the science of numbers. So mathematics is, uh, you know, in many, many aspects of modern life. Uh, but I want to talk about pure mathematics. I'm a pure mathematician at Imperial College London. And uh, pure mathematics is uh, not, necessarily, uh, not necessarily developed uh, with these applications in mind. Uh, it's, it's abstract puzzle solving. Uh, pure mathematics, if you like, can be thought, you know, it's, it's the study of uh, stating and proving abstract theorems, whether or not they have applications uh, in the physical world, abstract theorems like Pythagoras' theorem. 
And so we pure mathematicians are about, you know, coming up with uh, potential theorems, conjectures, and then proving them and turning them into theorems. That's what pure mathematics is. Uh, and the theorem really, you know, the statement of a theorem is a puzzle and the proof of a theorem is a solution to that puzzle. So we're thinking about abstract mathematical statements here. You know, I'll, I'll talk about one or two examples later. And what my talk really is about uh, is whether computers will be able to get good at solving these logic puzzles. Uh, so uh, mathematical theorem proving is, if you like, a game, you know, like chess is a game. And the question is whether we can get computers uh, to get good at that game. And uh, just like chess and Go, pure mathematics has a finite list of rules. You know, we've come up with axioms that tell us what mathematics is. Uh, but unlike chess and Go, uh, mathematics is played on an infinite board. You know, you can easily write down infinitely many mathematical equations because here's a very simple infinite class of numbers, the, uh, the counting numbers, the natural numbers. Uh, zero, one, two, three, dot, 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 they go on forever, right? Given any number, you can add one and get a bigger number. And so, you know, x equals zero, x equals one, x equals two, you know, these are infinitely many equations. So it's different to chess and to go because all of a sudden uh, we have an infinite board to play mathematics on. You know, there's finitely many rules, but we have an infinite board. So this is the key difference, but if, you know, if computer scientists have solved board games, then this feels like a very natural uh, progression in the system of trying to get, you know, trying to work on modern AI. It's a very natural target for AI because AI has got good at games on finite boards. And this is mathematics is a, pure mathematics is a very well specified game. We know exactly what the rules are. We know what is allowed and what is not allowed. And, you know, but, but the main difference is that you know, given a given a situation, you're trying to solve a puzzle. You're in the middle of an argument. You know, there's infinitely many is infinitely many moves that you can make next. So, pure mathematics. Uh, how do we get going? Uh, how did it start? Pure mathematics. It started off as a way of abstracting what people were experiencing in the physical world. So what do I mean by that? You know, the idea is you have two things in one hand and you have two, two of the same things in the other hand. That gives you four things, right? So two pebbles and two more pebbles make four pebbles, but then two sheep and two more sheep also make four sheep. You see, there's some common abstraction there. It doesn't matter if you use pebbles or sheep. Two trees and two more trees make four trees. Two tally marks and two more tally marks make four tally marks. So if you have a field full of sheep, you're an early shepherd and these sheep are moving around, but you wanna you know, make sure that no one's coming along and pinching your sheep, you can put four tally marks on a tree and there's one tally mark per sheep. You know, these four tally marks and these four sheep have got something in common. Uh, so there's an underlying abstraction here, right? Two pebbles and two pebbles make four pebbles, two sheep and two sheep make four sheep. And the underlying abstraction is that two add two is four. But you know, what does two even mean? It's sort of a funny thing. We can certainly have two pebbles and we can certainly have two sheep, but can we have two? You know, it's, it's a bit like red, right? You can have a, a red ball and a red chair, uh, but redness itself is an, is an abstract noun. You know, a red chair, red is being used as an adjective. But, you know, just redness, can you have the red without the chair? And that's what two is like as well. You know, two pebbles is a meaningful thing. But an abstract two, you know, this is where we're leaving the physical world and going off into some kind of abstract, you know, platonic universe, if you like, where there's an abstract two with an abstract meaning. So uh, here's Pythagoras' theorem. There's a blue right-angled triangle in the middle of that. And we put the square on the hypotenuse and the squares on the other two sides. And Pythagoras' theorem says that if A and B are the areas of the uh, smaller squares and C is the area of the larger square, then A plus B equals C. And again, this is an abstraction, you see, uh, because what is this theorem about? This, is, this theorem is about you know, an abstract two-dimensional square. How thick is that square? Uh, you know, in, in, uh, in Euclid's elements, that square is an abstract two-dimensional object. 
uh, living in some Euclidean plane. It's it's not a it's not a meaningful real thing. You couldn't make a square. I mean, you could make something that looks like a square, but it will have a it will have a thickness. Uh, Pythagoras's square is you know, is infinitely thin, and so how could that exist in our three dimensional universe, right? If it's infinitely thin, uh, it can't exist. But you can make one out of paper. You know, that's very thin, but it's not really the kind of square that Pythagoras was talking about. He was talking about an abstract, an abstract square. You know, with perfectly equal sides. No problems with you know, electrons or weird things like this. No problems with atoms getting in the way. These are, you know, abstract straight lines that really don't actually exist in our physical universe. An abstract square made from four abstract lines. You know, and the, uh, and the, you know at the end of the lines are abstract points. And these points, you know, they have no volume at all. You know, they're smaller than an atom. They're infinitely small. And yet they exist because they're an abstraction of what is going on. Uh, Euclid's elements, uh, Euclid uh, wrote, I mean, Euclid and his uh, his team uh, wrote uh, 13 books over 2,000 years ago where they explained how to manipulate these squares. Uh, the very beginning of book one, they write down the rules. Again, there's a finite list of rules in Euclid's elements. Uh, Euclid writes down five postulates and five common notions. These are, you know, these are fundamental axioms about the behavior of Things like the concept of equality and, uh, you know, things like, you know, what is a point and what is a line. And once these, uh, once these rules are established, these 10 rules, uh, Euclid goes on to develop, you know, an abstract theory of two-dimensional geometry. And by the end of book one, he's proved Pythagoras' theorem. He's deduced that theorem from the rules. So you can kind of see, you know, that a computer, if a computer can just follow a list of rules and we know what the rules are, uh, you know, a computer programmer could write down the proof of Pythagoras' theorem and a computer could check that proof. Uh, but could a computer come up with that proof itself? Uh, you know, these are, these are interesting questions. And, you know, what's going to, you know, what, uh, what will happen? You know, we're not sure. But there's an interesting question. Could a computer prove Pythagoras' theorem by itself? So I don't want to talk about geometry. I'm going to talk about arithmetic uh, in the rest of this talk. So I'd like to talk about the rules which define numbers, numbers like two, you know, the abstract two, not just two pebbles or, or two stones or two trees. Uh, I want to step back and try and find out rules uh, which define an abstract two. So that's where we're going now. Uh, and let's stick to, you know, uh, the natural numbers. So in, you know, in, in, I learned at university that the natural numbers started at one, but for the, pers for the purposes of this talk, is more convenient to have them starting at zero. So let's stick to the natural numbers, and now let's try and figure out the rules uh, which define those natural numbers. You know, which which rules of mathematics can be used to actually, you know, to make those numbers. Uh, and in particular, we can't just say zero is a number, one is a number, two is a number, three is a number, and that's no good because I'd like a finite list of rules because I'd like to tell all the rules to my computer and see if my computer can start figuring out theorems about numbers. Uh, so what's a finite list of rules which uniquely characterize those numbers, the natural numbers? Uh, and a guy called Giuseppe Piano in the 19th century, he came up with a finite list of rules which characterize uh, that infinite set. So let me tell you Piano's rules for the natural numbers. Uh, Piano's first rule was that zero is a number. So you can kind of see you know, the, the wrong path we can go down here is now having the, the next rule, one is a number, two is a number, three is a number. Uh, because we want finitely many rules, not infinitely many. But there's his first rule. So zero is a number. And uh, the ingenious rule, really, is the second rule, uh, which says this. If we have a number, if n is a number, uh, then the number after n is also a number, right? Given any number, there's a number after it which is also a number, the successor of n. That's what I'm going to call it. So for example, you know, the successor of zero is one, the successor of 38 is 39. The idea is that, uh, you know, the successor of number, the successor of a number uh, is also a number. So this is Piano's insight. And then his final rule was that there aren't any more rules. The idea is you can't make numbers in any other way 
other than by these two rules. So zero is a number, the number after a number is a number and that's it. Of course, you know, nowadays, you know, one goes to school and after a while one learns fancier numbers like pi and things like this, or, you know, the square root of two. But uh, we're not going to be talking about those kinds of numbers. I'm just going to stick to axiomatizing the simplest kinds of numbers, you know, the counting numbers. So those are Piano's rules for the counting numbers. Zero is a number, the number after a number is a number, and that's it. So there are the rules again, and, uh, and if we apply these rules, then there we are, you know, we have numbers. So uh, this successor idea, S of N, we're gonna see this coming up a fair bit, so let me just stress this, S of N, that notation there, S of N means the number after N, right? So for example, the number after 37 is 38, and we'll write that as S of 37 is 38. So there we go. And now, of course, we could start asking, uh, how are we going to make some more numbers, right? Uh, and we could also start asking, can we teach a computer those rules? Uh, but before we do that, why don't I just uh, step back and explain why I'm making all this fuss about the number after something or the successor of a number. Why don't we just call it n plus 1, right? Because 37 plus 1 is 38, right? Uh, so why am I calling it s of n, or the number after n, why don't we call it n plus 1? And the reason is that we're building mathematics from nothing here. We're building mathematics from scratch. So Piano's rules define numbers, but we haven't defined addition yet, right? We have to carefully define everything we're going to use. We haven't defined addition, so n plus 1 at this point in time does not make sense. You see, we are watching the theory of numbers being born here. Piano's rules give us numbers, but yet the standard things we do with numbers, like adding them or multiplying them, uh, we, yeah, we're yet to talk about. We're yet to define those concepts. We just want to talk about the concept of number. So before we have addition, uh, we need to just stick with this successor. The successor of a number is the number after it. And, you know, as summarized... Uh, uh, by an undergraduate at Imperial, uh, Chris Hughes. He said, before we learn to add, we must first learn to count. And I think that's a rather nice way of explaining it. Once we have the concept of a successor, uh, the idea is we know the number after a number, so we can use successor to count. We start with zero, and then we keep taking the number after, we get one, two, three, four, five. So Piano's rules give us a way of counting, and addition has to come later. Uh, so I just wanted to stress this because, uh, you know, normally we don't consider mathematics in this primitive state with numbers just born and addition not yet existing. So on to computers, and in particular I want to talk about a computer program uh, called Lean. So Lean is a free open source software, it will run on any modern operating system, and it's being developed by Microsoft Research. Uh, and it's a computer program that, you know, knows the basic rules of logic, uh, but is open uh, to what it does with those rules. So you can teach Lean uh, logical games and puzzles. And mathematics is an example of a logical game, uh, or pure mathematics at least. You know, once we start talking about applications, you know, we have to start being more creative. Uh, but pure mathematics, just with its abstract finite list of rules uh, is a great example you know, of a logical game. So Lean is an interactive theorem prover, and it's certainly not the only one. There are many interactive theorem provers, some of them very old, some of them dating back 30 years. Lean is a new one, a relatively new kid, but uh, here are some other examples of interactive theorem provers, Koch and Agda and Isabel, Metamath and Hollite and Holfor, and there are many, many others. Uh, you know, there are 20 or so interactive theorem provers and people design newer ones as well uh, because you know because we're trying to figure out which is the best one really we're trying to figure out you know for different kinds of questions uh, different interactive theorem provers uh, you know have, have different strengths so I'm going to talk about lean uh, because it's the uh, theorem prover I know best but uh, the things I'm going to show you in this lecture uh, can be done using pretty much any one of these uh, standard interactive theorem provers so we're going to start by teaching Piano's axioms to Lean. We're going to, we're going to teach Lean what a number is. So 
here we are uh, looking at a computer program. And uh, what's going on here is that this computer program will let me tell it things as long as they're logical and, uh, and then let me manipulate these logical things. Let me show you what's happening here. Uh, I've defined a new thing called a number. And how have I defined that number? I've said there's two ways you can make a number. I've said that zero is a number. And I've said that if n is a number, uh, then there's something called s of n. And s of n is also a number. So s of n is you know, the number after n. That's our mental model of what s is. Uh, and so now this system has this definition of number. So for example, we can, uh, we can check zero. And if we check zero, we see on the output here, uh, it says that zero is a number. And of course, we can check, we can check one. And if we check one, uh, we see it says error, unknown identifier one. Uh, and that's because we haven't told it what one is. So uh, we could tell this system uh, some more numbers. So let's define some more numbers. Like definition uh, one uh, could be the number after zero, right? That would be a good definition for one. And now you can see we have we don't have an error anymore. Uh, now we can see that one uh, lean now knows that one is a number, and we can press on here. We can do definition two. Uh, two could be let's define two to be the number after one. Uh, you see we're we're building numbers from scratch here. So we've told it what zero is, and now we have to keep going and tell lean these other numbers. Let's let's uh, let's do a couple more. Definition three uh, that could be the number after two. And definition four could be the number after three. Uh, so there we go. Now, now Lean knows what one is. Let's try four. Lean knows what four is as well. Lean says that four is a number. So now Lean knows the explicit names uh, for the first few numbers. Uh, and where we want to go next is we want to see uh, if we can teach uh, Lean about addition. So. Let's see if we can check 2 add 2. So 2 add 2, I see we have another error. Uh, we have a rather complicated looking error here. Fail to synthesize type class instance for has add number. And that's a rather elaborate way of saying that although we have some numbers, Lean knows what 2 is. Uh, Lean doesn't know what addition means because we haven't defined addition. We're at, you know, we're at a point you know, during the birth of mathematics here, uh, where numbers have been born, but the concept of addition has not yet been born. So we've managed to teach a computer that knows the rules of logic, but maybe doesn't know too much mathematics. We've managed to teach it uh, the concept of an, the abstract concept of a number as defined by Piano. Uh, but we had trouble with two add two because we hadn't got as far as addition yet. So how are we going to define addition? You know, this is sort of a, a funny question, but uh, this is the question that uh, we run into. So what are Piano's axioms? Uh, we've talked about the first two. We've seen them in action, but we haven't really talked about the third one yet. So what are the axioms? The first one says zero is a number. The second one says that if n is a number, then the number after n is a number. And the third one says that's it. And that's it uh, has some consequences. Uh, and one of the consequences of that's it is that every number is built using the first two rules. That's the only way we can make numbers. You see, I didn't even tell Lean that's it. I just finished the definition. But I wanted to stress it here because uh, that's it has a consequence, right? Let's say we want to do something with numbers. We want to, uh, we want to prove something about them or we, we want to define something using them. Let's say we want to do something with numbers. Uh, and here's the consequence of that's it. The consequence is this. If we've done it for zero, and if we've done it for n, then we've done it for the number after n, then that means we've done it for all the numbers, right? We have to cover zero, and we have to cover the successor case. And if we've done it in those two cases, then we've done it for all the numbers, for quite a general class of things uh, that we'd like to do with numbers. So this is called the principle of mathematical induction. If you've done it for zero, and if you've done it for n, then you've done it for the successor of n, then we can conclude we've done it for all the numbers. Uh, 
uh, or maybe more generally, it's called the principle of mathematical recursion. Uh, but this is the principle we're going to have to use if we want to define addition, uh, because numbers have just been born at this point, right? We have numbers, uh, but we can't add them yet. So if you want to add them, we have to define addition, and we have to define addition using only the principles we have. And uh, this principle on the screen here is the principle we're going to have to use, because at this point in, uh, you know, in the birth of numbers, it's all we've got. So we want to do 2 add 2, right? That would be a, a nice, simple thing to try. Uh, so we need to figure out how to add 2 to a number, right? So let's define addition. Let's define adding 2. Uh, so the first thing we need to do uh, is we need to do 2 add 0. We need to define it, right? Remember, the computer doesn't know anything about addition, so we can't do that addition for us. We're teaching the computer addition. So the first thing we need to do is define, we need to decide what the answer to 2 add 0 is. And I think a good answer for 2 add 0 is, let's say 2 add 0 uh, is 2. That would be a good, you know, that would be a good start. And then, of course, we need to say what 2 add the number after 0 is. And 2 add 1, you know, 1 is the number after 0. So 2 add the number after 0, well, we've got one more now. So that should be the number after 2. And then 2 add 2 should be the number after that, right? You can see the pattern in general. Uh, if we know what 2 add n is, and we need to figure out what 2 add the number after n is, well, you know, 2 add n, we've got, you know, we know what 2 add n is, and then we've got 2 add the number after n, that's one more than 2 add n, right? So 2 add the number after n uh, should be one more than 2 add n. You know, it should be the number after 2 add n. So there's the formula, 2 add the number after n, we're going to define it to be the number after 2 add n. And now that means that uh, using uh, this basic principle, this that's it principle, uh, we've defined addition for all numbers now, because we've defined 2 add 0, and if we know 2 add n, we've defined 2 add the number after n. So let me show you what that looks like uh, when we teach it to lean. So here we are. Uh, Back with lean, and here I've added the definition of addition. Uh, and in fact, I went more general than uh, adding two. I explained how to add x to a number. Uh, this first line here, uh, let's define x add zero to be x. And this second line here, let's define x add the number after n to be the number after x add n. And uh, so that's great, but uh, we still have an error uh, because. I've defined a function called add, but uh, Lean just needs to know that this symbol plus here, uh, this addition symbol, uh, should be something, you know, when, when it sees this plus symbol, it should use this add function. So I should do, uh, let's, let's define an addition on numbers, uh, and let's use the function add there. And once we've done that, uh, we see that 2 add 2 suddenly makes sense. Uh, 2 add 2 makes sense, and Lean helpfully tells us that 2 add 2 is a number. So Lean now understands addition, uh, and it can take a number like 2 and add it to a number like 2, and, uh, and it can come up with the conclusion that when you add 2 to 2, you get a number. OK, so we've now defined numbers and addition. So now we can play a game. We can play the 2 add 2 is 4 game. Uh, let's see if we can prove the theorem that 2 add 2 is 4. Uh, but of course, we're only allowed to use the rules we have so far. So perhaps I should uh, start by reminding you what the rules are. Uh, what are the rules? Firstly, uh, we know that 0 is a number. Piano told us that. And then 1 is the number after 0. 2 is the number after 1. 3 is the number after 2. And 4 is the number after 3. And then as well as that, we've defined addition. Uh, we defined addition by saying 2 add 0 is defined to be 2. And 2 add the number after n is defined to be the number after 2 add n. And uh, because, because of that's it, that's defined addition 2 add x for every number x. So uh, with those rules in mind, let's see if we can work out 2 add 2. 
So remember, two pebbles add two pebbles. It's very easy to work out, right? You just put two pebbles in your hand, two pebbles in the other hand, put them together and then count them. But this is an abstract two. It's not two pebbles. And we can only manipulate that abstract two using the abstract rules we have. So let's start. What's two add two? Uh, well, two, remember, is the number after one, right? That's the definition of two. So two add two must be two add the number after one. And now how do we do 2 add the number after something? Well, that's the number after 2 add that something. So 2 add the number after 1 is the number after 2 add 1. And that's by definition of addition. So now, now we have to do 2 add 1. Well, what is 1? Remember, 1 is the number after 0. So we have to figure out 2 add the number after 0 by definition of 1. And now here we have to do 2 add the number after 0 and we can do 2 add the number after something. It's the number after 2 add that something. Uh, so 2 add the number after 0 is the number after 2 add 0. And that's just by definition of addition. So now there's still an addition we have to do. Now we have to do 2 add 0. Uh, and what is 2 add 0? Well, fortunately, 2 add 0 we can do. 2 add 0 is 2 uh, by definition of addition again. And so 2 add 2 is the number after the number after 2. Uh, well, how are we going to work that out? What's the number after 2? The number after 2 is 3, uh, by definition of 3. And what's the number after 3? Well, that's 4, by definition of 4. So here is a rather long proof that 2 add 2 is equal to 4. And we finish the proof, so we say QED, uh, just like Euclid would have said. I guess. Uh, Actually, QED is Latin. Euclid would have said the Greek version of QED. Uh, but there, 2 add 2 is 4. So that's the proof that 2 add 2 is 4, that the abstract 2 added to the abstract 2 is the abstract 4. And what we've done here is we've completely taken everything apart. Uh, and we've shown it, and we've shown that 2 add 2 is 4 by very carefully stepping through uh, all the rules that we have. So, uh, let's see if the computer can uh, figure out that uh, puzzle itself. Let's see if the computer can do 2 add 2 is 4. So here we are over back with Lean, and uh, let's do an example. Uh, I claim that 2 add 2 is 4. So let's see if we can prove this. Uh, let's see if we can prove this theorem. You see here, uh, this question about whether 2 add 2 is 4 or not, uh, this question is now a little game, you see. Here we, have, here we have the goal of our game. Our goal is to prove 2 add 2 is 4. And down here we can type things. Uh, for example, we could type that seven-line proof that we just saw before uh, into the system, and the system could check that that was a valid deduction that 2 add 2 is 4 uh, from the rules it knows. But I'm not going to do that. Uh, I'm going to just type four characters here. I'm going to type REFL. And, uh, and now the computer reports goals accomplished over here. So what does that mean exactly? That means uh, that the system believes that we've proved that 2 add 2 is 4. So this is a bit surprising because where did the seven lines go? And what does this REFL mean? Well, this REFL is a little AI. So that computer AI uh, solved 2 add 2 is 4. We taught the computer the rules and some basic definitions, and then we then applied an AI, and the AI solved 2 add 2 is 4. Uh, so why is this kind of a deal? I mean, 2 add 2 is obviously 4. Any calculator could tell you that 2 add 2 is 4. Uh, but what's, you know, the, what the difference is, is that a calculator, when you buy it, it's, it's come with all the rule, it's come with all the instructions for how to do addition and how to do multiplication. It doesn't just come with the definitions, it comes with the algorithms. The algorithms tell the calculator how to do addition and multiplication. And, uh, and when you ask it to do a multiplication or an addition, it just performs the algorithm. The computer there, we told it the definition of addition, but we didn't tell it any methods at all for how to do addition. And indeed, when we tried to figure out 2 plus 2 is 4 using only what the computer knew, we saw it took rather a long time. So the big deal is that this computer was not told any methods, it was just told the rules, and it had to go and figure out the method. 
The computer worked out the method by itself. And, you know, it hadn't seen those things before. We told it some new things, and then it can go and figure out the methods. It's, it can look at what it has and develop methods by itself. This is the key difference. So, two add two is four, not very impressive, not going to get me a research grant, right? So the question is, you know, the real question uh, is that how much further does this go? So instead of just teaching it basic numbers and how to count and how to add, what about if instead we teach that computer an entire undergraduate pure mathematics degree? Because pure mathematics is just based on rules and the system, as we've seen, can learn rules. And, uh, at, you know, at an undergraduate at a university, we teach the undergraduates the rules and then we give them questions and see if they can figure out the answers to the questions using the rules. And then we give them exams and we see if uh, under time pressure, without access to any of the uh, learning resources they have, uh, we see if they can figure out how to solve the puzzles there. So can we teach a computer the entire, you know, an entire undergraduate pure mathematics degree? Well, uh, that's work in progress and it's coming along nicely. I mean, we have these several, dis you know, we have several different uh, systems and uh, people are working to teach these systems mathematics, you know, the rules of mathematics. And, uh, you know, with, with Lean, there is a big maths library which is being developed by people all over the world who are trying, amongst other things, uh, to teach Lean an entire pure mathematics degree. And we are about halfway through currently. And in a couple of years' time, we started three years ago, and in a couple of years' time, uh, we're going to be finished. And who is doing the teaching? Well, that's quite interesting. You know, is it AI researchers doing the teaching? No, it's not. It's mathematicians uh, doing the teaching. Once a mathematician learns the language that Lean speaks, you know, Lean is a programming language. And once a mathematician can learn that programming language, they can start uh, teaching the system uh, the mathematics they know. And undergraduates in particular, you know, I noticed that they were very good at picking up things like programming languages and they're interested in computers in general. And in particular, you know, they're interested in computer games. And this is turning, you know, this, this system turns mathematical problems into computer games. And uh, so for the first time in my life, uh, my research project, instead of working with uh, professional mathematicians, I've started working with undergraduates. And undergraduates from my university are amongst the team, uh, which is slowly teaching this system an entire undergraduate degree. You know, they learn the material, they teach the material to a computer. It takes a while. It, uh, you know, it takes a lot. I mean, the undergraduates have got other things to do as well. You know, they've got to learn the... They've got to learn the system, you know, they've got to learn the material themselves and they've got to revise and pass their own exams. And, you know, sometimes it's difficult. Uh, sometimes it becomes rather an art uh, to figure out how to teach the computer these things. Computers can be very pedantic, of course. And we might say, oh, something, this thing obviously follows from the rules. But the computer sometimes demands, you know, if the AI can't figure out why that's true, then the AI might demand that we uh, spell things out. So it's taking time, but at the end of the day, it's turning mathematics into a game, into a computer game, which I think is really quite an interesting point of view because, you know, there's, there's plenty of kids around who love computer games but don't like mathematics. So this is gamifying mathematics. It's turning mathematics into a puzzle game. And, uh, you know, the students, students find it fun. Students can get addicted to this thing. Uh, you know, sometimes they can... You know, I've, I've heard stories of students kind of staying up all night because they're just goofing around. Uh, you know, they're, they're working on a big puzzle. You know, they've set up the puzzle and they want to try and solve the puzzle. And they sit down and play the computer game, which corresponds to that puzzle. And then all of a sudden it's the next morning. Uh, this is just the kind of thing uh, that kids do with computer games. But all of a sudden uh, they're learning mathematics doing it. And so what about the AI experts? What are they doing? I mean, the AI experts might not know the mathematics, right? An AI expert might have done an undergraduate degree in computer science. They might not know a lot of undergraduate mathematics, especially the technical stuff uh, you do in the final year of an undergraduate mathematics degree. But what are these experts doing? They're looking at our fledgling database and they're thinking, well, this is what the humans have figured out, right? You know, this is the 
Uh, this is like the expert chess games, which the humans, which the humans have played. We have expert mathematicians, uh, you know, have, have decide what's in an undergraduate degree, and now we're teaching at the computer, and so the AI experts are somehow interpreting that as you know part of the human good ideas, and they've just started this year, 2021 already, January. Uh, I saw a talk last week at a Lean conference. Uh, where somebody from OpenAI, uh, which is you know a company like DeepMind based in uh, San Francisco, uh, OpenAI have started uh, to teach their machine learning algorithms, uh, our our mathematical database, which we're building using simpler algorithms. But the algorithms we're using are not machine learning. They want to use machine learning on this growing database to see if they can start teaching the computer to start developing this database itself or to start using this database to prove other things. For example, can they use this database to start solving exam questions of the kind we give the undergraduates? And so what have they done? So just last week, I saw a talk where they were just showing very, very basic results about natural numbers. Their AI can do some of them by itself. And, uh, you know, other much harder questions as well. You know, there's, there's the beginnings of progress in this area. So this is kind of interesting, you know, if we can actually train a computer to become a mathematics undergraduate. And of course, you know, we're not the only system uh, working on this. There are other research groups trying the same with the other systems, you know, but this is, this is happening right now. You know, we've given up on a uh, chess and go because those are too easy, but let's start on mathematics. So it's a very appealing research project to see if we can train a computer to solve puzzle games which correspond to mathematical theorems. And uh, of course, you know, this is like the 1970s of the chess programs now. Uh, perhaps our current attempts uh, are, going to, are going to be lousy. Uh, but one thing's for sure is that, you know, over time, we will learn more about what's going on. And, uh, you know, past events have shown that if you work on these kinds of questions for maybe 10 or 20 years, then you do tend to start getting results. So the idea is in principle appealing. And one day, I'm absolutely sure, somebody will get this to work. And what will happen when we've got that to work, we're gonna have a system which can try and pass an undergraduate mathematics degree. I mean, maybe at some point, we'll have a system which does pass an undergraduate mathematics degree. Then what, you know, does it get a degree? How does that work? And of course, after that, you know, we can start to do more. There are many, many famous uh, unsolved problems in mathematics. For example, the Riemann hypothesis is one that seems to be uh, uh, in, you know, the, in the kind of the, the public psyche. People seem to know that this is some hard problem in mathematics. You know, humans can't do it. Will computers be able to do it? I personally feel that we're a long way off, uh, a very long way off computers solving profound problems like that. But uh, I do wonder whether this is the beginning of training computers to solve these things. And, you know, one is left with these kinds of questions. When will computers start to beat undergraduates at proving mathematical theorems? And, uh, by the, you know, by the time they get to that point, uh, will computers be able to start helping researchers? You know, even if they can't beat researchers, will they be able to start helping researchers? You know, solving simple problems that the researcher can't be bothered to check the details of. Let's just get the computer to grind out the details. You know, this is, a, this is an appealing sounding question. And I think that, uh, you know, these things are going to start happening within my lifetime. So that's it. Thank you very much for coming and listening. And uh, I am around. So if there are any questions, uh, then I will uh, attempt to try and answer them to the best of my ability. I should stress that I am a mathematician and not a computer scientist. So uh, I'm not going to be great at uh, answering questions about uh, current methods in uh, machine learning. But, uh, you know, I shall do my best. And thank you very much for listening.